Uh, good evening. Thanks for saying good evening back. Uh, so, uh, my name is Adam Davis, and on behalf of Oregon Humanities, just want to say thank you for being here on our, our first really rainy fall night. Uh, before we do anything else, I hope you'll join me in saying a big welcome to Desmond Mead. Uh, Desmond made a long trip from Florida and has a long trip back, but uh, at least from our perspective, it's uh, entirely worthwhile. We are kicking off our 2019-2020 Think and Drink series on the theme, Making Democracy. And with that phrase in mind, uh, we are delighted to be starting off with Desmond Mead. The format for tonight is going to be, we're going to talk for a chunk of time, uh, we'll open questions from a microphone over here, and then when we formally end the program, we're going to ask, uh, we're going to ask you to hang out, and we'll have food in back, and we'll throw a question at you and encourage you to talk to uh, either people you came with or even better, people you didn't know when you came in. Uh, so that's the general shape of the evening. And before we jump in, uh, I want to thank some folks that made this possible, and then I want to ask you just a couple questions to help Desmond get a sense of the room before we get going. So, uh, first, community partners who helped get the word out about Desmond being here and who are doing work that really, I think, overlaps with the spirit of Desmond's work. And I'm just going to name all seven organizations too quickly. Uh, but next up, Oregon Latino Health Coalition, League of Women Voters of Oregon, League of Women Voters of Portland, Pineros y Campesinos Unidos del Noroeste, Unite Oregon, and Right Around Portland. And I just want to say thank you to all those organizations for the work. I want to thank a few organizations that have helped support this and other events like it, uh, beginning with, for this whole series, Tonkin Torp, Stoll Reeves and the Kinsman Foundation. Uh, and then uh, the Oregon Cultural Trust, which supports a whole range of activities all around the state and is a really unique organization. And uh, lastly, uh, the National Endowment for the Humanities, which in some ways is beleaguered but still quite strong and makes a lot of this work possible. So thank you to all five of those organizations for getting us here. questions, which I'm afraid I'm going to ask you to answer with noise. <laughs> they proceed from fairly straightforward to less straightforward. So first, if this is your first Oregon Humanities Think and Drink, could you make a little noise? Uh, if it's your second or you've been to other Think and Drinks, can you make a little noise? Okay. You were so loud that you lit up. It was beautiful. Uh, if you can remember the first time you voted, could you make a little noise? All right, I said these were going to get increasingly hard to answer with applause. Last question for you. Uh, if you feel hopeful over the long term about democracy, could you make a little noise? All right, so with that question, with the question, <laughs> with the question about democracy over the long term and about voting, uh, Desmond has done amazing work on extending the franchise, on making it possible for people to vote who were not allowed to vote. And I wanted to start, Desmond, by, uh, by asking you, uh, like, when voting showed up for you as a meaningful activity? Like, when did voting strike you as something that mattered and that you realized you were going to be committed to? Wow. Um, Adam, first of all, thank you for, for having me. Um, I do want to throw a little, like, monkey wrench in your plans, if you don't mind, <laughs> right? Because when I got, came out here, you know, and I looked out in the audience, I saw a lot of beautiful faces. I saw a diversity of faces that actually uh, is the driving force be 
for wanting a more inclusive and more vibrant democracy. And I was just hoping that maybe that lighting guy or that, that power in the sky could just raise the light up one more time so I could at least take a selfie of this audience, <laughs> right? Because I came more for them than for you. That's Adam. good, that's good, <laughs> as it should be. You're like Elizabeth Warren up here. She does, oh my God. <laughs> All right. Thank you. So sad to say that, um, you know, that, that importance of voting um, did not really, um, mean much to me until 2011. Um, and that was the year that um, a new administration was coming in uh, in Florida, uh, Governor Rick Scott. Uh, he just defeated uh, Alex Sink uh, for the governorship. And uh, the first thing, even though he didn't campaign, campaign on it, the very first thing he and his cabinet did when they got into office was to address felon disenfranchisement. And what they did was, uh, prior to him being in office, uh, Governor Chris had a, a policy that automatically restored civil rights to, to nonviolent offenders. Um, and so when Governor Scott got into office, the very first thing he did was roll back those policies. The first thing he did. The very first thing the cabinet did and made it even more difficult for um, an individual to uh, get their rights restored. And I remember thinking, I was sitting back and I was thinking, wow, you had four politicians that had enough power to decide which American citizens get to vote and which American citizens don't get to vote, all with just a signature on a piece of paper that all of the work that we did uh, prior to that, to actually get it to a point where some folks were able to get their rights restored. And, and as a matter of fact, over those four previous years, over 155,000 people were actually able to get their rights restored and to see all of that get undone by just a signature of a pen on, on, on a piece of paper. And something just, boiled up inside of me and said, that's way too much power for any politician to have. Whether they're Democrat, Republican, or whatever, that no four politicians should have that much power to decide how inclusive our democracy is. And, and, and when I looked at, you know, he had, uh, he had won his election by 60, by around 63,000 votes, and at that time, uh, the sentencing project uh, in collaboration with Jeff Manza had just recently released a study that showed that uh, Florida had over 1.54 million people who couldn't vote because of a felony conviction, right? And that, like that moment, I really started to understand uh, the power of voting and why um, eradicating felon disenfranchisement laws was so uh, important. So that's 2011. What were, I'm, here's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking about voting and what it does or doesn't mean for so many people. Some people have access to it, some people don't. Some mm -hmm. people care about it, some people don't. Uh, it sounds like it hits you hard. And I'm wondering sort of where you were with either voting or thinking about politics at that time. Like, how did it suddenly arrive if it was sudden? So, you know, and it's ironic you asked that question, right? Because I was, I was actually just talking about that today, right? As important as voting is, right, that's not the most important thing in people's minds, right? Because guess what? Life is. <laughs> and so you're talking about, and, and for instance, and in, in, in I'm talking as a person that's been in the criminal justice system, right? Sure. So someone that's incarcerated, when they're getting ready to be released, they're not thinking, oh my God, I can't wait to go vote. Right. You know? 
What they're thinking about is, man, where am I going to live? Yeah. Uh, 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 how am I going to get money to pay bills or, or, or to get a, a cell phone, you know? Yeah. Uh, what about my transportation? How am I going to get food in my stomach? Those are everyday issues that keep pounding at the doorstep sure. or the door of people's lives. And it drowns out the importance of voting, right? And then our work is to somehow or another bring that back and show them how voting can impact those, those critical needs that they have. But the natural need, you know, and even like, even in the Bible, Jesus had to feed the multitudes before he taught them, mm -hmm. right? Because there are some natural needs that people have. And, and we have to, here's the catch now, we have to understand that. Mm -hmm. So we who understand the importance of voting and how critical it is, right? We can't go beating somebody over the head with that and totally ignore the everyday challenges that they're facing because that's not being, you know, genuine with them. Okay, so now I got a ton of questions in my head. Okay. Um, so thank you already for putting them all there. Um, I want to ask the question one more time because of what you just said. So having been incarcerated, thinking about stuff like when is it possible to hold a job and what are the challenges to get a job or housing? Uh, how is it that, that this is the thing, that voting is the thing, that with all that stuff hounding you, that you went, this is the one that I'm not just going to work on, but I'm going to drive all around the state all the time. I'm going to... Like, how that? <clears throat> I think part of that is the transformation, right, of thinking of voting as something that we do, right? as an exercise of democracy, how we transform from that to understanding that voting is a tool. You, f you feel what I'm saying? I think so. And so when we as, as, as or let me speak for myself, as a directly impacted person, right, what I look at voting as, right, is not a way to get my favorite candidate in there or somebody who sounds good in there. It's not a way to support a particular party or another, mm -hmm. right? How we look at voting is as a tool to get the needs that we have, the immediate needs that we have addressed, right? And I think that, that it's, a, it's, a, it's a, um, a nuance there, right? And, and I think that understanding when at some point when I looked, you know, Matter of fact, I could tell you the thing I thought about that, you know, after Governor Scott, you know, signed that policy into effect, and I'm mad at Governor Scott, right? And I, but I thought about it. I was like, wait a minute. If I get 1.54 million Floridians to march up to Tallahassee and bang on his door and say, Governor Scott, give us our rights back, right? When he look out his window, what he's going to see is 1.54 people who can't vote and he'll go back to doing what he's doing, right? And so I, I'm thinking this in my head, right? And, and so my initial thought was, okay, but what if I can just get maybe half or a quarter of those 1.54 million to get five family members or friends who love them enough to pledge to vote on their behalf, right? And have those five family members or friends said, Governor Scott, give back my loved one the right to vote. When he opens up his window, he will see more people than his margin of victory and have to give that considerable thought. And so that got me on that path. And maybe it's worth saying, because it's possible that people in here don't know that number you're holding out, 1.54 million, that uh, as we're sitting here, over 1.4 million people uh, have regained or gained the right to vote thanks to work that Desmond is doing in Florida. And I just want to... Which is it, is, a, it is a hell of an achievement. And it is also an imperiled achievement. Like even as we read about what's going on in Florida right now, and I just want to ask this of you because of the, the, 
the word I, I said at the outset for our series is making democracy. And in preparation for your coming out, following what's going on in Florida, and that now uh, it turns out that people who would have their right to vote, it sounds like the current administration has said, well, until all their fines are paid, not only will they not be allowed to vote, if I read this correctly, not only will they not be allowed to vote, but if they vote or try to vote without having paid all their fines, which are not collected in any centralized way, it will be a felony. Is that, do I have that right? <laughs> it, those are a weak set of booze right there. I just want to let y'all know that. But that's okay. That's okay. Because I would say not quite. Great. Not quite. <sighs> let me see how to put this. A lot of the contention... Um, that we're seeing in Florida is either based off of a misunderstanding of what's happening or based on a deliberate attempt to create a situation that folks can thrive in. And, 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 and I'm going to tell you, I really do believe that a lot of our problems that we're dealing with could have been solved a long time ago, but people profit, right? from trying to solve the problem. You, 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 let, let me see if, see if I could say it even better, right? <laughs> when you are not experiencing the pain, there is no incentive to end that pain, mm. right? But you could show enough act like you want to end the pain. Okay. And you could show enough fundraise off of you acting like you want to end the pain. Okay. But the reality is you don't really want to end the pain, right? You have something else going on. Are you, are you with me on this? Yes, yes. I'm and that's why it's so important that we have to have people who are closest to the pain at the center and, and, and not at the center just as a face of a movement or just one of the puppets or the talking heads of a movement, but actually involved in the strategy on how to alleviate that pain because there is a real-time incentive mm -hmm. to relieve that pain, right? And so because of that, uh, matter of fact, I heard this phrase a few years back about the nonprofit industrial complex, right? Sure. Yeah. All right, and that, and, and and so we we see some of the the fruits of that. Here's the reality, and let me um, be as very clear as I could possibly be. There is no one, and and. And, and that's another thing, that a lot of the people that's providing information are people that just know parts, bits and parts yeah. of the campaign. Um, there is only but a handful of people who have been involved in the campaign from its very inception all the way through. As a matter of fact, there's no one but me. Because, it, no, seriously, even my wife was not there at some points. Uh -huh. You know what I'm saying? And don't tell her either. With <laughs> Nikki, you better not tell her. I'm telling you. Uh, but even my wife or um, one of the, the most brilliant people that, that I've met as it relates to campaign is a lady by the name of Mila Alayubi, mm -hmm. right? And, you know, there were some times where she wasn't even there. Uh, so I'm speaking from a perspective of a person that knows where all of the, all of the bodies are buried, everything that we've gone through, the nuances and all that, and I can tell you this. And so I, I'm, I'm just really um, validating myself or sure. whatever. Um, when we set out to do this, and, and we were able to do some um, uh, a polling, uh, when we first polled, it, it was horrible. Uh, we had maybe around 40% uh, people who were supportive of, of restoration. Um, and what we did was we decided to engage in focus groups in the different parts of the state, whether it's South, Central, and North Florida, and different um, sections of people. And what came out of those focus groups um, was that people naturally, without us even asking the question or without us even prompting people, they automatically came out and said, you know, we would be okay with this except for murderers, people who kill people. And then we would be okay with it except for people who rape people and people who molest children. That just naturally just came out. And so we decided, well, let's, 
let's do carve outs and see how we poll on this, right? And we did that, and when we ran the poll, it shot up to 77%. And we were like, oh my God, we might be onto something. Mm -hmm. But we had a more dilemma still, because our belief is that you should never lose your right to vote, mm -hmm. right? That's number one. And number two is, if you lose your right to vote, if you're released, if you're deemed safe enough to be released back into this community, then you should automatically have those rights reinstated, no matter what you've done, all right? And so let, let me be very clear on that. But we know that we're in a state like Florida where it's extremely difficult to win a ballot initiative, and we had to decide, do we move on idealistic grounds or on strategic grounds, right? And so, and then we did, you know, that really set us back about a good four or five months. For the internal thinking about it. Just that? for the internal, just on that right there. And then we did the research and we've seen that out of the, at the time it was about 1.5, 1.6 million people, that less than 2% of the 1.6 even had those type of charges. And so we had that proverbial question, if you're, in a, if you're on a cruise ship and you have 100 people on there with 99, with uh, enough life votes for 99, do you let everybody drown or do you at least try to save the 99 and hopefully you can come back for the one? And we said, well, let's try to save the 99. Mm -hmm. So we knew that we did carve out. So that right there indicated that this was a strategic approach to felon this or to removing felon disenfranchisement. And, we, and, and because our number one goal is not the number of people who we actually um, re-enfranchised. The number one goal was knowing that prior to Amendment 4, that in Florida, when you convicted of any felony, whether you go to prison or not, that you lost the right to vote for life, for life, right? And if you had any kind of chance, it was only up to the mercy of that governor, right. whoever it may be. So you would have a case where Charlie Chris in four years, 155,000 people had their rights restored. Rick Scott in eight years, less than 5,000 people got their rights restored. And they might have said something nice yeah. about his political yeah, of course. They said like that, that they donated to his campaign or whatever, and he got their rights back. And so we, we, we were very strategic with it, right? And so once we determined that the carve-outs gave us this opportunity to do what? Remove that lifetime ban and create an alternative pathway to being able to vote that would not require anybody to grovel at the feet of any politician, right? And that's what we wanted, and we destroyed that wall with Amendment 4. But because we were strategic, there were some pebbles that's in the way. And one of the things, one of the pebbles is that people who committed murder that was released, or people who committed sexual offenses that were released, well, we still have to find a quicker pathway for them. But here's the other thing, and, and I, I'm taking a long way you're to your good, answer. You're good, you're good. It, but it's, it's, it's good for people to know. So once we realized that, okay, if we do the carve-outs, people are good for this, right? Then our next question was, well, how soon can we get people their rights restored? And we landed, based on the polling and the research, we landed in two areas, after incarceration or after completion of sentence, mm -hmm. right? And the one that polled the highest was completion of sentence. And on top of that, when we looked at the pros and cons, right, that there were a whole ton of pros for completion of sentence and only one con. And you know what that one con was? That if we said completion of sentence, that it might provide, it, it might create some obstacles for people who were poor, right? And we knew this. Because here's the deal, when you talk about completion of sentence, Adam, if I, and I can I use you as an example? Please. Okay. So this is our thinking. Okay. I break into your car. You left your iPad on your car. I break into your car and I steal your iPad and I get caught. But Florida has a law that says if I do that, right, written into that law by the legislature years ago, says that if I'm found guilty of breaking into your car, I face up to five years in prison and up to a $2,000 fine. Okay. That's written within the codes, the statutes, right? 
And so when I appear before a judge and I'm found guilty and the judge sentenced me to two years in prison and orders me to pay a thousand dollar fine, that is my sentence. And I cannot say I completed my sentence until I did those two years and I paid that thousand dollar fine. Got it. Are you with me on this? Yeah, yeah. All right. The other part of it is, is that how I got your iPad was I broke your car window. And so the judge told me that, you know what, Desmond? You broke Adam's car window, stealing his stuff, and it cost him $400 to replace that window. I am ordering you, right, to, to pay $400 of restitution to Adam. We have, and, 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 I, I, and, I, and I talked to my colleagues across the country, and, and where I landed was where we were at at the very beginning. As people who have caused pain, in our community, a trauma in our community because of the acts that we did. Part of our position now as leaders, yeah. right, is knowing that we want to repair the harm that we caused, right? And if I go to you, Adam, and I say, Adam, I want you to vote so I have my citizenship restored, then I must have a genuine intent within my heart mm -hmm. to make sure that you're restored as well. Mm -hmm. And so it's a value that we stood on and said, okay, I could see completion of sentence and the, the fines that's attached to the statute that I am um, guilty of, of breaking. And I could see me as a person saying that I should repair the harm that I caused you. And that's what we would have, because remember our tagline was when the debt is paid, mm -hmm. it's paid, mm -hmm. right? And so, that was an understanding that we had moving into this, right? What happens and where things went sideways was number one, the minute we got politicians involved in this, right? <laughs> that is said. And number two, the minute the press got involved. And then if things get sensationalized, things get convoluted in the reporting, and it created something that was totally against what the campaign was all about. And the campaign was about bringing people together from all walks of life, from all political persuasions, or organizing them around the lines of humanity and getting them to show up, not based on hate or fear or division, but show up based on love, forgiveness, and redemption, right? And that was a direction that we know our country need to go. Yeah. We, we cannot bemoan the state that our country is in right now with all the division and hate and fear, if our tactic to defeat that is hate and fear mm -hmm. and division. Mm -hmm. you, can't, you can't drive out darkness with darkness. You can't. And you can't drive out hate with hate. So there's so much in what you're saying, yeah. which is a good thing. And I want to ask about That was about just a prelude to my answer. That was just getting started. Really? <laughs> then I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, a couple of things I want to ask about. One is when you said the first way it went sideways was when the politicians get involved. And actually, I'm not sure I want to go here, but I want to note that there's something, because I want to get to what you were just saying about building connections across uh, fear, hate, division. But I just want to note that there's something that's interesting about the fight that you've been engaged in so hard, which is to participate to make it possible for all of us to participate in a system about which there are so many reasons to feel skeptical. So I wonder if we can, like I want to ask you about that as we keep talking. Maybe I can just ask you to keep it in there as you're, as you're talking as we go. But I want to pick up on the last thing you said about building this sense of connection. And, uh, and I want to do that especially around because you talked about the press and the way I think also some politicians will play on fears and play on division. And it's not, you don't have to play on fears and division to say that uh, the, the prison system disproportionately affects some groups of people more than others. That's real. I don't need to tell you that's real. How to deal with the very real uh, different effects of systemic uh, inequity and still try to connect across difference in the way that you just talked about. <laughs> so um, I'm blaming this answer on Adam, 
All right, so if anybody is upset at what I say, blame Adam. Anybody have any pushback for what I say, push back on Adam, please. Not me. Adam was the one that asked this question. All right. How do we deal with that? You know, and so one of the things, and another reason to blame Adam, because Adam told me that um, when we talk that we want to challenge people to think beyond, outside the box, right? We want to stimulate critical thinking, all right? So knowing that what I'm saying is not the gospel, but hopefully it would stimulate critical thinking. And so I'm going into a very touchy area with this. Okay. Right. Thank you. For I didn't fly all the way to Portland to play it safe. Right? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Black Lives Matter. Woo! That's right. Black Lives Matter. Right. My personal. My personal perspective, and it's going to deal with the question. Trust me, I'm, I'm going to get there. You. I trust you very much. My <laughs> personal perspective is that there was something critical that was lost in that phrase, Black Lives Matter, right? And what came out of that was, then all of a sudden you heard, oh, all lives matter, Right? And then even police was like, blue lives matter too, right? Like blue life, really? Um, anyway, <laughs> but when you, if you start to think about why folks were saying all lives matter, right, in response to black lives matter, right, and when you start to think about that, you realize that something was lost in that, right? Something was lost. And so let me tell you just how I looked at Black Lives right. Matter. And I'm not projecting on anyone else that used that term, but just tell you how Desmond used it, right? When I look at black, that phrase, Black Lives Matter, what I look at it as is not someone saying that someone is more important than the other. What I look at it is that it's a cry for help. It's a cry for attention that's saying something is wrong, right? And I look at it in terms of the body, right? That if I was to walk down those stairs and twist my ankle, my ankle sends a message to me that something is wrong down there, right? And Black Lives Matter, when I think about Black Lives Matter, as part of this body this, of, the, of the human race, a part of the body of, of American citizens, that there is a particular part of the body that's in pain and is crying out for attention because something is wrong. And just because my ankle is, is telling me that it's sprained and it's in pain should not be saying, well, my wrist is important too. Uh -huh. You understand what I'm saying? It's, it, and it's not saying that the ankle is more important than the wrist. Right. But the interpretation that some folks was getting was that the wrist is insignificant because the ankle is crying out for pain. Yeah. And it's not because we are all part of the same body. Right? Whether we're black, white, Latinx, whether we're uh, 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 Americans, whether we're from another country, whether we're transgender, whether it does, we're all part of the same body, and that's that human race. And if there's an element of our body that's hurting, what do we do? What do we naturally do? We pay attention to it and we treat it. Not ignore it and talk, well, my eye is important too, my eye matters. And my fingers matter. That doesn't alleviate the fact that there was something there. And so I say that yeah. to say that when we do talk about race and intersectionality and gender biases, that I think it's important that we do it in a way that don't signal that I'm separate, that I'm not a part of that body, that I'm separate or I'm even shunning the, the wrist or I'm shunning the eye that I do it in such a way to let you know that 
I'm part of you. I am a part of you. That means that there is no me without you. That means that in spite of the color of your skin, Adam, that you're my brother. That means that in spite of mistakes that you might make, in spite of the differences of opinion, that you're still my brother. And I'm not separated. And the thing is, is that we draw these lines of separation and there are separations within the separations, within the separations, yeah. and within the separations, when in reality there is no separation. There isn't any. And so the, 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 the challenge, how do we have that conversation? How do we allow you yeah. to be you and make that mistake? And not lose sight of the fact that there's still an ankle to deal with. Mm -hmm. Right? And so I think it's a challenge, but I think it's, it, 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 it can be accomplished. And I think it starts with proximity. Mm. Right? I think it does. It starts with proximity uh, and, and recognition that we are all the same body. Uh, you, you've put a lot of miles on your car. A ton. <laughs> a ton of miles on your car. I mean, proximity is a... It, it's surprisingly hard in our culture. Proximity seems like, uh, when you said it, I thought, yes, proximity. And then when I'm out in the world, I think, why is it that it's so damn hard for us to be near each other, especially people who seem to be a little bit different? I don't us? think it's hard. Great. I don't think it's hard, Adam. You know why? Because I was just telling someone that when we, the, the, think about the moments when we are proud to, to be an American or we're proud of humanity. Think about when are those moments, right? And those moments are generally after a natural disaster, sure. right? When a hurricane comes and, and destroys a community that how people just stand up, mm -hmm. you know, and, and come to the aid of another human being and is able to put aside those, those, those divisions and barriers. You know, when, when, when um, you, you, you're, you're driving, one of the things I tell folks, and that was something that I campaign embraced. You know, you're driving down the expressway, you know, enjoying yourself, listening to what Hank Ritter. Who do you listen to? Uh, I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say, um, oh, if I can choose, I'm gonna say Otis Redding. O Otis Redding. That's what I'm gonna say. Ah, look at you. That's what All right. I'm so you're driving down the road, you're listening to some Otis Redding. Thank you. And you see an accident ahead, right? And there's somebody laying on the ground, and you decide to stop the car, right? You made that decision, you stop the car, you get out your car and you run up to that person laying down on the ground. Your first question is not gonna be, did you vote for Donald Trump? <laughs> it's not gonna be that. It's, it's not gonna be how much money you make. It's not gonna be, are you transgender? Or it's not gonna be, are you undocumented? It's none of that. Mm -hmm. Your first question is gonna be, are you okay? Mm. How can I help? It's in those moments. It, it's, it, so it's not hard. We do it every day. We do it after disasters. The question is, why does it take a disaster yes. to get us to come together like this? That is the question. Right? Yeah. Why, you know, my, my wife hates me telling this story, but the image of when uh, a couple of years ago the, 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 uh, the hurricane went through Houston, caused the flooding, and they had the story of the African-American man in the boat that rescued this white guy mm. and stopped to let him go back and get his Confederate flag. In spite of all of the hatred and bigotry that that flag represented to that African-American man, in that particular moment, he was able to move that flag out the way and seeing another human being. Another human being. Right? And I know it's hard for some people to even phantom that. But let me tell you, when you're in a moment of need and when your life is in peril yeah. and you're crying for help, you don't care who the help come to your rescue. Mm -hmm. You don't care whether, if they're wearing a, a, a Robert E. Lee hat or not. What you're looking at is saving your life. Okay. And it's in those moments, I'm telling you. So I don't think it's hard. Yeah. I really don't think it's hard. I think that that's something that we have not allowed ourselves to get accustomed to doing because we allow powers greater than ours to actually per perpetuate 
division among. And that's what happens. When we could divide the masses, yeah. then the elites can control the world. There's so much in there that I agree with that you said better than I've ever even thought that it worries me. Um, but I think what you're saying about what happens after crisis and that you're saying we can do that even without a crisis. And it seems to me you're kind of talking about the big challenge of democracy, which is sort of how do we feel like we're together when we don't have a common enemy or we don't have a threat that's bearing down on us? How can we just keep steadily working at this thing? Well, why do we need an enemy? Great. Why is it that we need an enemy? Why not a goal? You know, Amendment 4, we didn't have an enemy. We didn't, we didn't have any enemies. We didn't attack anybody. We didn't paint any politician or anything as, as something. No. We, listen, we had over a million more votes than any candidate on the ballot received, mm -hmm. right? And we had at least a million people that voted for our current governor that voted yes on four, right? And one, let me share this with you. Two months before the election, we held our last focus groups, and we brought a bunch of conservatives, white conservatives in a room, right? Uh, a lot of them strong Trump supporters, and we showed them some videos of uh, commercials that we created. And these were the commercials. We said, if you vote yes on Amendment 4, MS-13 is going to invade Florida, rape your women, and kill your children. Another one said, if you vote yes on Amendment 4, it would deal a fatal blow to Donald Trump, and those doggone progressive devils are going to take over this beautiful state of ours. You with me? Mm -hmm. After we showed those horrible videos, I mean, I almost started to believe that, right? It was so real. I was like, really? They're coming? You know, but after they showed those videos and we polled the people, we had a supermajority support for Amendment 4. Mm -hmm. Just think about that for a minute because I think we cracked the code because typically we worry about that white, Appala that white guy living in Appalachia that will vote against welfare even though he's dependent on it, voting against their own self-interest. And here was a case where we made a very compelling argument around political, around racial lines, and these people had held steady in support of Amendment 4. Mm. Why? Yeah. Because we didn't organize a campaign with an opponent mm. Right? We organized around the campaign around love, someone that you love. So I'm not voting against somebody, I'm voting for somebody who I love. You feel me? Mm -hmm. And that ties that bind is much stronger than some fickle allegiance to any uh, political party or any ideology, because at the end of the day, love can conquer all. And so when those people seen those commercials, they was able to withstand all of those triggering images and phases because at the center of their mind was not Black Desmond, but maybe their son who's the opioid addict or their uncle who's the alcoholic that keep getting those DUIs, you know, or, or, or someone that's a meth head or someone that... Whatever, the, whatever mistake they made, that's what they held on to for dear life. And they were able to withstand that. And that's why on election night, I tell folks that those 5.1 million votes that we got was not based on hate or fear. They were based on love. Mm. And so the world actually got to see love winning the day. Mm. It really did. Thank you. It's, it's, to think about love, the heart, uh, and grounding the idea of extending the franchise in that rather than policy or even slight inst It's just interesting where to put the emphasis when we think about democracy and how strong it is or isn't. And early you talked about pain and, he's, and the body. 
And I guess I want to ask, I want to, I want to ask if maybe to step back for a moment from the specific campaign. And like when you think about democracy, if it has purchase, if it matters, like what do you understand it to be at its core? What is this thing we talk about, democracy? <laughs> so, you know, I'm thinking about this image that I've had in my head uh, quite a number of times. And I don't consider myself to be like a history buff. Um, and so if, you know, there's some errors in it, just excuse it for just my imagination. Um, <clears throat> but when I, so I'm going to answer your question. I'm going to try to answer your question, but I'm going to try to maybe do it a different way. Great. Because there's another issue within that, right? Because when we talk about what democracy looked like, the thing about it is, is that we don't hold ourselves accountable to making sure that that's what democracy looks like. Mm. Right, so we have it in our head what democracy looked like, but our actions don't back that up. Okay. Right, and I'm going to get to that. Um, so I think back in the days, you know, we're in a community here, and then what we would do is say, okay, uh, here we are. This this is our own special community, and there's a much larger governing body out there. And what we're going to do, we're going to get pick a few of you guys to go and represent our interests, make sure that you're protecting our interests. And so we're gonna send you to Washington, D.C., right, to represent our interests for a couple of years, and then you're gonna come back to your farm, right, come back to your business, and then we're gonna send some more people, right? And, and so it was, it was a, a honor uh, to be able to serve the needs of this entire group right and that's something that you did for a limited amount of time and then it rotated right um that's what i look at and that's what i think about democracy mm -hmm. but that's not what it has become mm -hmm. right and we have people who uh, please i don't mean to offend anyone so please forgive me if i do uh, i'm not pointing anyone out this is just generally speaking. Sure. But now we have people who we may send somewhere and they'll never want to come back home. They just want to stay in that position mm -hmm. because they've gotten accustomed to that power or intox mm -hmm. intoxicated by that power, right? And they would, like in the state of Florida, we had a guy that's been there since before I was born, right? And he just, and, and, and that was a problem because he wanted to hold on to it so much that there was nobody groomed to even take yeah. his place. Yeah. And he was making sure that he didn't groom anybody because if he groomed somebody, he might challenge him. Mm. And he wanted to hold on to it. And now what happens is in that process, we changed and we started treating public servants like demigods. Mm. Right? The where we bow down to them and acquiesce all of our power to it, right? And, and I always talk about, you know, I don't know if any business people out here, but what successful business do you know, right, to where the boss has to beg an employee to do something, and even when they don't do it, they get a promotion or a raise? Yeah. There is no successful business like that. And so that's, the, to me, that's not democracy. That is not. Yeah. Democracy, to me, is when we have people from our communities, right, that we elect that go to represent our communities and they represent our interests and not a political interest or I should say a party interest, but the interests of the people, right, to where their actions are not dictated along party lines, but rather around people lines. Mm -hmm. And they have the courage to do that, right? and where they are accountable. And so a democracy is where I have the power, right, that I'm the boss, they're the public servant, and I tell them what to do, and when they don't do it, guess what? They get fired. And I don't think we're operating in that sphere yet. And we have to take 
I think, ownership of that because we acquiesced our power and we lifted up politicians to a, higher, to a level much higher than just being a public servant. As, as Not you, much applause in that one. Come on now, clap it up. Clap it up now, come on. <laughs> as, as you've built the power of the organization you lead, and it sounds like the growth and the success of that organization is one that almost every organization can learn from. Like, are you, when you look forward, what are you looking at? What are you thinking about having that power serve? That's a great question. First of all, let me tell you, you talked about the growth of our organization is Eddie Morales in the house. Please stand, Eddie Morales. Lights up, please. Eddie Morales. There he is. <laughs> the world and organizations need more people like Eddie Morales. Let me tell you, when nobody else wanted to be around, Eddie was like, I'm hanging out with you. And hey, I've got to admit that I did have an uh, incentive because uh, we were close to South Beach. <laughs> so, <laughs> so he got to get a little party in. But people like Eddie... Um, that recognized the importance of our work and, and, and worked with us to get us in front of funders and to get uh, uh, funding to do the work and, and the funding in such a way that didn't have so many strings attached, which allowed us to engage with our creative juices and make things happen. And so when you talk about the future, you know, I got to give a little credit to Eddie. If you here, oh, it's unbelievable. You need to talk to Adam again because you guys are leaving the wrong people at home, right? But um, when, you, when you talk about that future and looking forward, let me tell you, I'm excited, right? Because after winning Amendment 4, I think that it's something special. We already know that the impact of Amendment 4 has an impact on this entire country, right? And a lot of people are like, yeah, Amendment 4, yeah, Amendment 4. But I think that we're just beginning. I really believe that we're just, Amendment 4 was not the end. It was the beginning of a new beginning. I think we're going to do something special in Florida that's going to affect the rest of the country. That uh, people like Nikki, who's here, that, that, that does the work here around voting, is going to really kind of appreciate because what we're doing in Florida moving forward is that we believe that the, the, the best messages, uh, when you talk about people who've lost the right to vote and have fought long and hard to gain it back, they are the most authentic and the best messages to talk to everybody else about how valuable the right to vote is and how we honor that right by actually showing up at the polls, mm -hmm. right? And so FRC, when you talk about that path forward, we are changing, we want to change a culture around civic engagement, around voting, right? That people who are registered to vote that but don't show up or people who are eligible to vote that don't get registered to vote, that man, this democracy depends on them. They could be the heroes of democracy, not a politician, but the people, the people in our communities, they can be the true heroes of democracy by showing up, you know what I'm saying, on election day and making their voices heard. And that is that message and that's that drive and that's that trajectory that we're on that now that we got our right to vote back oh my god we want it to be infectious right and we want to start maybe in, in, in Florida to show the world what we can transform just by showing up And it sounds like that transformation that you have in mind has a lot to do with, you said, the people most impacted. Uh, that seems like that, too, like most to gain. As you've worked on that, have you found that to be hard message, difficult? Like, how? Oregon actually has a pretty good record of people showing up to vote relative to a lot of other places in the country. But I guess, again, what you've done, uh, you've gotten people to show up, you and the people you work with. How do you get people who don't have, uh, who don't feel it? How do you get people who don't feel it to feel it and show up? 
Easy question. Thank you. <laughs> Talk to him. Talk to him. Talk to him. Let me tell you. So my wife ran for office. I remember she gave me a walk list, right? And she put me to work. And typical walk list, right? That you would go into the community, you would knock on this one door, you would walk past about a good seven or eight houses, and knock on another door because these walk lists are all with who? Super voters, mm. right? And so we walked past 30, 40 voters to talk to one, mm. right? Every one that we talk to, we ignore 30, right? <laughs> and then we have the audacity to, well, people don't show up. Uh -huh. How can they show up? We, we, we're not even talking to them. Mm -hmm. We're not. And so let me tell you, in our campaign, when we said we're talking to everybody from zero on up, and we was really playing around with the zeros. <laughs> we love the zeros. Let me tell you, don't quote me on this. Okay. Midterm election, what's the turnout rate in Oregon? Anybody have the number Come on, on somebody that? shout out the number. You don't have to be right. Huh? 70-ish? Yeah. During midterms? Yeah. And what do you do during presidentials? 100? <laughs> what's going on? It's in the 20s in midterms. Right? So we have some disagreement here. Oh, about it's a the disagreement. Percentage. All right, so we're going to ask Nikki. Is Nikki around? Nikki Fisher? All right, tell me. Oh, sounds like a lawyer to me. I know. You know? We don't want a nuanced sound answer. Sounds like right somebody now. used to work for the ACLU or something. <laughs> I tell you. So give me your average turnout rate in the midterms 30%. That sounds more realistic. And, and in our area, it's around like in the mid to high 20s, right? Okay. So 2018 election was a midterm election. When we looked at the people that we talked to across the board, we had a turnout rate of 68%. Wait, 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 wait. Don't clap yet. Don't clap yet. Now hold up. When we looked at the people who we talked to that had at least one returning citizen in their household, yeah. the turnout rate was 82%. All right? And so people come out when you talk to them and you give them something to come out for, right? Something that's not fickle. And they're less likely to come out for a candidate than they are for someone who they love. And that's why I told people the, day, the, the, the Sunday before election, I said, listen, some people, some diehard, uh, progressive folks got mad at me when I said this, that the most important person on the ballot was not named Andrew or Ron. The most important person on that ballot was named Pookie and Ray Ray and Shaniqua and Desmond and Neil. And that's what sold. That's what sold. And so if we have, can have conversations with people, because sometimes we put barriers out before we even launch our campaign to limit who we can talk to and who can talk to us. If we remove those barriers and just go out there and have conversations with folks, we see a different outcome. Even when you looked at the, some of the people or the voters that, that Trump inspired that came out, right? We can't, I can't even get mad at them because we've been ignoring them, All right? And it reminds me as a parent, any parents in there? Any parents with kids? Any parents with daughters? So let me tell you something. Tell me if it makes sense, all right? If we don't talk to our kids about sex, somebody else will. So what you prefer? All right? What do you prefer? Do you want them to learn about it from somewhere else or on YouTube or wherever? If they're going to learn about it, they need to learn about it from who? From us. And so when we ignore voters, and, right, then we leave open the opportunity of somebody coming to speak to their needs and their fears, mm -hmm. their desires. Mm -hmm. And that's what happened. Because we ignore people. So you want to connect? Man, let's have those conversations. And let's not say, oh, well, we can't go in that neighborhood. Or we can't talk to that type of person. 
No. The first people who I got to sign the petition were people that was wearing Rick Scott T-shirts mm. at a polling location. Mm. The first congressional district that we qualified was a conservative congressional district. Mm. And two of the top three were conservatives. Mm. And so we showed that, no, let's not limit ourselves and put these labels on people, right, and say that we can't talk to them or they, they're not going to connect with us and we haven't even had a conversation with them. We just heard from some talking head on a talk radio or on a news station. And we just projected all of that stuff on our neighbors. But when that storm comes and wipe out the community, then we, now we don't care about that. And so we need to know that just like after a storm that we can go and knock on our neighbor's door and say, are you okay? Yeah. That we can do it before the storm. Yeah. We can. And that proximity, oh my God, that proximity will work wonders. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Kyle, for bringing more water down for Desmond, for starters. Um, I want to shift us in just a moment to questions. And we have a microphone over here. Um, so I'm going to ask if you have a question for Desmond uh, to maybe start lining up. I want to ask one more question as we're building toward that, and it's a question uh, provoked by what you just said and, and something that I don't think you've talked much about, but I'm curious about, and that is, like, that's not easy knocking on doors of uh, people who you have been told have it out for you. And I say that just, you know, that's the most surface example. Uh, how do, have you felt like this project of proximity that you've engaged in? Like, how has that felt? <laughs> yeah, it's not easy. It's not easy knocking on those doors when you're not experiencing the pain. You see, when you, when you in pain, <laughs> you don't care where the help come from. Mm. You just need help, mm -hmm. right? You're not, you know, you're not going to say somebody, oh, no, I don't want you. I'll wait for somebody else to come save me. You're not saying that, you know? Yeah. You're gonna, when you need, when you're in there, and that goes back to, again, yeah. why it's so important that we must equip people to actually lead that effort because mm -hmm. there is a level of commitment that, is unparalleled. You see, mm -hmm. any other person would have been leading the Amendment 4 effort, we would not have even gotten on the ballot mm -hmm. because they would have walked away because everything said, no, it's impossible. Mm -hmm. It's going to be too much. And they would have walked away because mm -hmm. they had nothing to gain. Mm -hmm. You know? And so, yeah, I, I think it's, it's just about, you know, having those people, right, that, that the way it's, it's not about something that's political. It's not about, you know, a party. It's just about a situation that needs to be resolved, mm -hmm. and they need it done, like, like now, yeah. like now, you know, yeah. when you're in that, when you have that split and headache, you know, you don't care if I go to Walgreens or CVS, do you? No, I don't. You know, <laughs> and, and it's a CVS right down the street, but I like Walgreens myself. So, you know, because Walgreens, they supported the movement, you know, so I'm going to go to Walgreens three miles away and you're not trying to hear that right now. Right. You're know, like, no, I need something now. Yeah. And so... Uh, just how do we cr generate that spirit in the campaign, yeah. uh, whether it's uh, to elect someone or whether it's for a movement or whatever. But when you talk about engaging in voters and being able to talk to people that you don't normally talk to, you know, have the people who are in the pain lead that charge, you know. And what you will find out is once you start talking to them, yeah. you're going to be like, oh, my God, 
this was not as difficult or awkward as I thought it was. You know, and you might be like, you're not like them guys I hear about, you know, but it's that proximity. Great. So we're going to turn to questions. But before we turn to questions, I want to take a deep breath. And I would like to say a big thank you, a provisional first thank you to Desmond for the work and for the thinking he's doing with us. So. Desmond, it's Ben at Minton. The last time I saw you was about a year and a half ago in Loudoun, Virginia. I was wearing a suit and tie, which was befitting the area that you were in. And before that was in New Orleans at Unrig. And I'm thrilled to see you here. Um, your right brain talk has really engaged my left brain. Um, our turnout here in the midterms was 68% and our uh, turnout in the last general in 2016 was 80. We vote by mail. So we knock on doors and then people just have to fill out a ballot and mail it. And when I moved here last year, I thought, why didn't the rest of the country do this? This is insane what we go through to get people. My question is, um, speaking from my left brain, what is your next goal? What is your next objective now that you've passed four and now that the state has imposed the limits it's imposed, what's next for you? Well, th thanks for the question. Um, and those of you all who have never been to an Unrig Summit, you need to like Google that and go to that. It's, a, it's an amazing conference. Say the name of it one more time. Unrig. Unrig Summit. Thank you. Um, so on a, a much broader uh, scope, my next mission is actually to, to make voting exciting again and increase uh, uh, voter levels of voter participation. That's on a broad level. On a micro level um, is to uh, use Florida as a testing ground to demonstrate the power that black and brown communities have always had, but didn't realize that they did, right? Um, you know, um, I could give you a, a good example. I'm gonna give, can I give a couple good examples real quick? Please. Right. Quick, quick, I'm gonna try, I love stories. But for instance, we have a, a, a district in, 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 in the city of Orlando, right? Um, and this district is a very important district where it's one of the, it's the richest district in the city. Uh, they have all of the major stadiums there, the universities there, a lot of money pours in, and they also have the poorest people there. And whenever you have a district where you have a lot of money coming in and poor people there, you know what happens, right? With that G word, right? And that district is so important that they call that district the pathway to the mayor's office. You with me? Um, <clears throat> the last two elections there, the first, well, two election cycles ago, the person who won that district won by 127 votes, right? About 10% people showed up to vote, uh, won by, yeah, 127. The very next uh, election, which was the last election, the person that won that district won by 225 votes. And the total amount of voters that showed up was 2,500. You with me? Are you sure you're with me? Okay, then this is the district that's the pathway to the mayor's office. You with me? In the last four months, my organization has registered, you ready? Over 3,000 returning citizens in that district alone. And those 3,000 people and their family members show up to this race that's coming up on November 2nd. It doesn't matter who wins, because whoever wins knows that the only reason they get to get in there and stay in there, right, is because of those returning citizens that covered that gap. You have to understand the gap was only 225 votes, right? And we're bringing a minimum of 3,000 people to that party. 
Coincidentally, I want to say it real quick so I don't cry. It's also going to be my first time voting in that district in so many years. And see, y'all about to make me cry because I'm not, I'm not just going to vote by myself. I'm bringing my son, two of my sons, and my wife to vote right along with me. We're taking like a, a page, taking the page out of the history books back in the civil rights era when dad went to go vote, he took the whole family. That voting was a topic of discussion at the dinner table. And that's what we're gonna do. And we're asking all of our returning citizens that we registered, don't come by yourself. Bring your family member, let's celebrate. Let's make sure that they vote. But see, what happens when they show up, it's going to shift in the power right then and there. And the people in power will have to understand, they would know, because we would demonstrate, right, that we're taking back the power that was once acquiesced to you. As people who've been silenced for so many years, we understand the value of not giving up our voice or our vote so damn easily that we hold people accountable and don't let them just get away with anything just because they have a D next to their name or R next to their name or that they're the color of my skin. That there's a level of responsibility that elected official must have and must adhere to or there's consequences behind it and we have to be bold enough to make them feel the consequence. And that's what we're going to do. And, and, and so we're, we're going to try to create that, 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 that aura in Florida. And, and, and in, in August, when you see judges that's going to be getting put in, in on the bench, that's going to get put there by people who were once sentenced by judges, right? When you see the district attorneys and, and sheriffs that have to now bow to the will of the people in black and brown communities and attend to their needs and change their policing practices because if they don't, they won't be in office. When you see that, <laughs> communities all across the United States would know that, wait a minute, we got that same power here. We've got it. And so since all eyes is on Florida, we might as well give them a show, right? Right, Eddie? <laughs> And that's what we're going to do. We're going to give them a show. <laughs> well, my name is Rex. I'm going to ask you a question because you think about democracy a lot. And you talked about gateway precincts. And I'm thinking New Hampshire and Iowa. What would you say to the Democratic contenders when they are going through gateway districts which are not, don't look like America, states like New Hampshire and Iowa, and how do they organize and bring forward the kind of power you're talking about. So I want you to come back to the mic one more time. And I know I heard you, but I want you to say that again, just a little bit slower. <laughs> okay, I'll say it again. Uh, I wanted to ask you what your advice was gonna be for the Democratic presidential contenders, and then you brought up the issue of how certain districts or certain states become gatekeepers for who gets to even compete. And I think you're, New Hampshire and Iowa are not, I was raised in Iowa, so I'm not, no, nothing against Iowa, but they don't look like America. And yet they are the ones that we say, if you don't do well in New Hampshire, you don't do well in Iowa, you can't be a national contender. How do you deal with the fact that we don't get to vote in Oregon until after all the primaries are finished? We have no say. I, you know, I thought that's what I heard you say. Okay, right? that's what I said. Because I asked almost that same question about what the hell makes Iowa and New Hampshire so damn important. <laughs> They're first. Right? But I, I disagree with one thing. I, okay. I won't say that they don't look like America. I think that they are a part of America. Part of America. Right, but they may not reflect the majority of, of, of America, right? You don't see yeah, yeah. that diversity in, those, in that area. But I asked that same question. And the answer I got was that because it looks good and it helps build momentum. 
That's the answer yeah, I got. It. And then Iowa actually have it in their, uh, uh, their, their constitution, I think, that they must be. So if another state move up the primary, then the legislature have to, by law, move their primary up so they're the first ones. And so uh, th that's the way, that's the Napoleon complex, I guess, you know. <laughs> and we feed into it, you know, and, 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 and some candidates live by that. You know, I, I think, um, and, and even they point to President Obama because I think he came out of Iowa with the win, right? And that helped propel, you know, gave him momentum for the rest of the country. But I always wondered about that. Um, I think that we put too much stock in that. And because of that, I think it kind of, um, the word that I'm looking for, it, it, it takes away, it, it becomes now mechanical and artificial, you know, and, and, and folks are, I think a lot of folks are engaged in an artificial uh, way of campaigning now and not the, the personal and the human way. So you know, what would you advise? What uh, would I advise him do well to not go to him. Iowa? Not go there. To not go to Iowa to show that, you know what, if they want to, if, if, if they should go to another state and not acquiesce. And that's what I think candidates are doing. They're acquiescing uh, something to Iowa to make, to give Iowa this feeling of superiority or that they can determine things. And they're not grabbing a hold of their own power as a candidate. Right, if I know that I could win a whole bunch of other states, then why am I kissing Iowa's butt? They don't have enough electoral votes for me. You. you know, to be honest with you. I wanted to let that phrase, why am I kissing Iowa's butt, just linger yeah, in just, the air. Yeah, oh. <laughs> and I also wanna, I have a practical request, and a practical request with an eye on, you mentioned your family, and I know that, I just wanna let folks know that Desmond is gonna be flying back to his family later tonight. And so what I wanna ask is that, uh, is that we could actually hear of questions from the people that have queued up for questions. So I would like to hear all the questions Can briefly. I uh, yeah. Well, I want to let Desmond choose sort of how he's going to respond to the questions, and I think we'll call okay. the formal program there. Yeah. All right, I won't. I won't give a, a soliloquy or anything to. So come on, thank you. Talk sorry. to me. Heck yeah. All right. Uh, my name is Jose Luis Jimenez, and I want to ask you a question that probably no white consulting firm here in Oregon can answer. Uh, so gearing up to the 2020 census, where we're, our biggest issue that we're going to be facing is uh, mitigating the fear of undocumented immigrants that don't want to give the information that won't even read any of the translated materials that all these campaigns would even like say that that, that would that would print out. Um, so, like, what would you, what, what advice would you give us to kind of going out on doors and engaging this community? But also, like, the people who are going to be knocking the doors most likely going to be white. So, how do we even engage like a freaking Brad go, going up to my house and really like connecting with them on a human level? Yeah. So that is that's not even working. You know, even in, even in like, for instance, African American communities. Especially talking to low propensity voters, a white guy come and knock on my door. I think that's out of the police or for something, you know. And I'm not, and they come and, and, and they showed it, because I'm gonna tell you, when we had returning citizens canvassing communities uh, for district attorney, well, not for district attorney race, but for a county election that which the district attorney was running, um, what we seen was that, and our canvassing, when you canvass communities, you generally have like a 20 something percent contact rate, right? When we hired returning citizens to canvas community, they had a contact rate of over 75%, right? And that's because if a white guy come and knock on my door and ask for Desmond Mead, I'm gonna say he's not here, you know? But if a returning citizen from my community come knock on the door, they're not gonna ask for Desmond Mead. They're gonna say, hey Desmond, what's up? Listen, I got whatever. That's number one. Number two, you gotta get people who can relate to the folks that, they, uh, that they're canvassing. But number three, and I think it's the most important, Right? It's why in the hell, when is the census? January. Why in the hell are we only talking to people now about something that's right around the corner? That is so transactionalist, right? For real. And it creates undue pressure, not only on the canvasser, but even on the people that you're trying to talk to, right? 
Because you're not coming to talk to me because you care about me. You're coming to talk to me because you want me to do something for you. I might endanger myself to give you something that you want that I'm not going to benefit from. So what is the incentive is there? I don't know you. When we're talking about dealing with communities of color, it should not be no, and it, people get tired of this last minute stuff. Parachuting in at the last minute and then trying to herd us like cattle to do something like we can't think for ourselves. We must engage in long-term relationship building with the communities that we claim we want to empower. We don't empower people by just rushing at them at the last minute. And so that's what we have to do. I'm sorry for the long answer. It's Please good. forgive me, Adam. No, it's... All right, give me a shorter question. I can give you a shorter answer. Can we do this? Can we? Give can me a we... yes or no question. Okay. We got either, two more people. I... Either, a ver either please ask for a very short answer, or I'd like to get just a few more so that, and I'm, I have your plan in mind. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. So my question is, you had referred to us as a body, and when the ankle is hurting, it cries out. What are some of the things and the conversations that you're having with the Pookies and the Shaniquas who really don't see themselves as part of America? And in, in, to contextualize it, like there isn't an American ideal that we all can ascribe to, that we can all consider and call ourselves Americans. So I really want to know what are some of those things that you're saying to those parts of the community that just don't feel that they are a part of this. And 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 and, and I think that's that's a real uh, thought-provoking question that actually require more than I'm gonna be able to give you, but I'm gonna to try to see if I can just compact it some, right? The thought of not being part of America, it rears its ugly head in moments of pain, right? It doesn't rear its head in the good times, you know? It doesn't rear its head at the football games, you know, at the clubs. It doesn't rear its head, you know, at, at the parties or whatever. It rears its head when we see one of our own, our family member that is gunned down on the street and left lying on the street like a dog. When we see how we're being beat down in, in the prisons, we see how we've been sh being shot in our own homes. That's when it rears its, its head that we're not a part of, right? But we are. As, as, as traumatizing as this system is, as, as traumatizing as, as, uh, and, 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 and painful as our experiences are, we are still part of this. We are. And we have got to, when I talk to, when I talk to some young cats, you know, in, in, right in the hood in Liberty City or Pine Hills in Orlando, you know, I talk to them as, you are part of this, and by being a part of this, you actually have the power to fix this, right? And that we can't have this feeling of defeatism because if we are not part of it and we feel we don't, nothing's going to change, then where's the hope? And without hope, what good am I? And so I, what I talk to people about is that we got the short end of the stick right now, but the reality is, is that we actually got the juice to flip this because we as people of color, we are the margin of error. We are the margin of error. When you have a governor that wins an election by 63,000 votes and there's over 808,000 registered African Americans and over 912,000 registered Latino Americans that didn't even bother to mail in the ballot? We can't say we don't have that power. We got the power. In my lifetime, I can't remember any American president that was able to get in that White House and not win the state of Florida. And it's 1.4 million of us. But let's just take it away. Let's say 500,000. 
400,000 African American men and women. We have the power. And the thing about it is, is that I can either perpetuate the despair or I can take on the persona that where other people see obstacles, I see opportunities. And we could grind and we could organize old-fashioned way one person at a time and we could build an army that we don't have to televise and we could flip this. We can elect our own judges. We can elect our own sheriffs. We can elect our own prosecutors. We can elect our own state uh, 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 public defenders. We can actually do that right now in Florida in communities of color. And I say that when we do that and we change these policies, we'll see a difference. And if we don't, we might need to catch the first ship sailing. <laughs> Head back to the motherland. I think we're going to go with the last question before we close. What time <laughs> Okay. Hello, uh, my name is Amira and I'm 17 and I'm currently working on lowering the voting age to 16 in Oregon. And um, I know you've talked a lot about how people don't have the incentive to put an end to that pain when they're not experiencing it. And so um, with me, you know, as a person who can't vote, I'm experiencing things like school shootings and the threat of climate change that gives me a ton of anxiety and just things like that and then we go and we push for these movements and the response that we get from adults is oh that's cute um, or that's ridiculous why would we do that and so I'm asking what is your advice to really you know get people who already have the power to vote to vote based on love and not a common enemy or resistance to something. <laughs> Y'all ever notice that it's always the youngest one with the toughest questions? <laughs> ah, so, all right, so I got a two-part answer for you. First of all, uh, congratulate, uh, congratulations on just being a young person that is really getting this right, and, and, and trying to push for change around voting. Um, one of the things I remember talking to some young folks in Orlando um, and some folks from March for Our Lives, uh, and when we did the math, um, they, numbers don't lie, right, and that there's like, in, in Orlando, there's a certain amount, number of high schools, and in Florida, I don't know about Oregon, but in Florida, you can pre-register people. All right, oh, see? So we could pre-register 16, 17, 16 and 17 year olds, right? So all my juniors and seniors, and maybe some sophomores that stayed back a year, right? I could register every last one of those students. And when they turn 18, in the mail, they get a voter registration card. Instant voters right there, right? And when you look at the numbers of seniors and juniors, guess what? In some cases, they cover that margin. They cover that margin. And so my thing is, is that, you know, okay, I got to tell this quick story, right? Okay. Quick, all right. <laughs> quick story. <laughs> okay. Of how uh, the, 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 the thinking and the strategy behind me meeting my beautiful wife, Sheena. All right. Nikki, you can tell her this part, because I already know you're going to tell on me about the other stuff. So tell her this part. That, and my wife is the most amazing and beautiful woman in the world. I'm telling you, she is amazing. She has more organizing skills in her pinky than I have in my entire body. And I have a big body. Um, but let me tell you, uh, the, the, the thing that, I'm coming to you, I'm telling you, I'm coming to you. Um, in elementary school, I had this crush on this girl. My wife told me not to mention her name ever again. So I'm just going to use the initials, VT. And I was a shy guy. I'm still a little shy. And I remember sending a friend over to find out if she likes me. Yeah. Right? He never came back. <laughs> <laughs> and he stole VT from me. <laughs> but at a very young age, that taught me a very valuable lesson. And you know what that lesson was? Never depend on anyone 
to get the things that you need. And so when I seen my wife, I didn't send anybody to ask her if she like. I walked up a very steep hill on a hot and humid day in Tallahassee, Florida, and stopping to, to wipe myself down and spray on some more cologne, right, until I have got a hold of her. But I went and got her because I needed her. Some told me I did. And I tell that story to say that as a young person, right, to never depend on anyone else, right, to get you the things that you know you need, right? And that you, with that energy and that insight that you have, that you could start a movement around, uh, 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 with people who are the 16 and the 17-year-olds, right, that would create a wave of voters that won't take none of that nonsense when they come out. And you could be a catalyst behind that. So I want to encourage you to keep on doing what you're doing, right? Because I think you're headed in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you. I want to do, I want to do two quick things by way of closing. First, uh, I want to encourage everyone that doesn't have a plane to catch to stay and talk to each other uh, about, I think our question is something like, what does voting mean to you? And I would encourage you to aim for the kind of proximity that Desmond has been encouraging us to uh, think about and practice. And so talk to someone you don't know. Please stay. There's food back here. We've got some space. We've been inspired to think about all sorts of things. What does voting mean to you? Please hang out and talk about that. And Adam is going to tell me if any of you all leave early, too. That's right. So. Just know that I will get a text message. <laughs> I would also say that coming out of here, uh, this work of proximity and of conversation and of trying to move people towards more engagement, uh, with this series, with the work Oregon Humanities is engaging in throughout, we're trying to get people talking across different perspectives about the community we make up together. So please grab someone that I work with or grab our stuff and keep showing up and making sure that we're talking about what you think uh, we ought to be talking about in community. Uh, I want to thank you very much for coming. I want to ask you to join me, please, in saying a big, huge thank you to Desmond Demir. <laughs> <laughs>